Good morning, my name is John Mollison. I interview old guys, I draw their airplanes, and I'm part of the production team of Old Guys and Their Airplanes. We're here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum in their outdoor pavilion, getting ready to interview live one of Korean War's amazing heroes, Royce Williams. Now, what you're gonna see on the screen is you're gonna see a number for you to text questions but to get that, uh, get your mind going of what kind of questions that we can ask this guy, uh, we're going to have a little film. It's about 18 minutes, and it'll give you a background of Rice's Korean War service, but also insight into his character and the kind of person that can do something so amazing. Sit back, and in about 18 minutes, we'll be back live with Royce Williams. Everyone seems to understand that the odds are, in some way, stacked against them. After all, there's that old phrase that no one gets out of life alive. But still, we have to face tomorrow's challenges. Well, that's the value of a hero story. They tell us that whatever it is, it can be done. Against all odds, victory can still be achieved. Still, we have to be careful that we don't get fixated on the story and forget the substance that made the story. On November 18th in 1952, a Navy pilot was pushed into a moment where he had to defend himself against overwhelming odds. One David against seven Goliaths in an aerial knife fight that lasted 38 minutes and he came out on top. But if you really want to get a handle on the moment, you need to know more about the man that made it. This is the story of Royce Williams, a child of the Great Depression. He's from a tiny prairie town in South Dakota, and yet he ended up in a proxy showdown between the world's greatest military powers. When we got on top of the clouds, they were probably 50 some thousand feet and uh, putting out contrails. And I saw them as they were closing on us. We were headed on at each other. I uh, called out, tally ho, meaning I see them. I uh, prepared to fight seven MiG-15s as they approached. And I said, do not engage. So I said, we are engaged. They are there and I'm gonna have to handle the situation. We lived right on the edge of town and we had a large grove of trees next to us. I spent a lot of time over there just bird watching and so forth. But about two miles outside of town was a creek. But the, the big trick was when uh, ice would break in the spring to see who's going to be the first one to go swimming. <laughs> and I did not, but my brother did. And boy, <laughs> Not for long, and he came out shivering. <laughs> uh, dumb, of course, but uh, we're still talking about it. So it's those things that count, I guess. Yeah, I'd go out and get a couple of ducks before breakfast, go back and leave them with my mom, and clean up a little bit and go to school. How old were you then? How old was that? Oh, I would guess uh, 12, 13. Oh, actually, I was 11 when I first started driving. Um, I think we had phones, and they were the kind you would ring, and you had so many rings, and that was for you. And so one of the cottages called down and talked to my Uncle Charlie, and he threw me the keys to the car, and he said, Hey, Royce, Cottage 37 wants 50 pounds of ice. I said, Yes, sir. He said, Well, deliver it. I said, Charlie, I, I don't drive. He says, here, take, take the Chevy. So we went out and started up and drove up to the ice house and uncovered from the uh, straw and so forth that uh, keeps it from melting, cleaned it up, put it in the trunk, and delivered it. How, what, did, what did the Depression mean to you and your family? My dad was a grocer. And all of his regular customers, we maintained a book on them. And everything they bought, we wrote down. 
Some of the families, the books grew, but no payments. One time he told me, Royce, he handed me, I think, about five of these bunches of books. He says, you can have anything you can get from it. <laughs> he just given up on it, and it's on him, on the house, and anything you can collect, you can have. <laughs> it isn't going to come in, not likely. So, so did you go out and collect bills? I did not. I uh, saw his wisdom and <laughs> just went about doing what I was doing. <laughs> well, there was nothing to forgive for that guy. Yeah. I was at the University of Minnesota. I was majoring in uh, geopolitics, so uh, <laughs> I was already beaming in on this. I said, holy mackerel, they're calling up the reserves, and here I'm a regular Navy guy, and I'm trained in all this and hot to trot. How come they're not sending me? And then not only that, we graduated, and then they sent to us postgraduate school. I said, there's a war on. And I was assigned to a Corsair squadron because I was qualified in Corsairs. When I came down and I saw those jets, and I, gee, I'd like to fly that. I looked up to who the commanding officer was of the Panther squadron. And lo and behold, it was Sam Holm. Like, ah. He was the executive officer of the ROTC unit at the University of Minnesota. So I gave him a call and I said, I'm scheduled to Red Squadron, but I'd sure like to get in yours and fly jets. He said, see what I can do. The next day I had new orders and I was in his squadron. One MiG versus a one Panther. Is that a is that a fair fight? Uh, if somebody has a surprise, they've got an advantage. Uh, depends on the situation, but uh, if they're both uh, up to fighting, the MiG has the advantage. I knew I was in their threat area, but when they broke up, I thought they might be going home and getting ready to land or something. So when they came in, invisibly, all shooting, it was a surprise. And uh, uh, immediately maneuvered and uh, got in a good position for a short burst and shot down number four. And uh, he started smoking a little bit, but he dropped out of formation. And my wingman at that time directed all of his attention to that guy, left me and followed number four down. Yeah, so there are three there, and that's where my attention is. And they zoom on up, and a high rate of climb. And uh, I tried following them best, but they were getting ready to reattack. And meanwhile, these three are coming in from another direction. So I uh, prepared to fight uh, with. Uh, checking my uh, gun sight and testing the guns. And uh, I had, didn't have any instructions about what to do, but uh, they, I told them it's seven MiG-15s as they approached and turned around right over me, heading back to the direction they came from. And they said, do not engage. So there are my instructions, I guess, but I said, we are engaged. There's no way I can duck out safely at this point. I mean, they are there and I'm going to have to handle the situation. I've got my concentration on whatever is active at that time. In the meanwhile, they're swirling or whatever, gaining a position to take their turn. Lead aircraft is, has his wingman and the guy that just lost his uh, wingman, went down and being followed by my, my wingman, went off to the left and probably 2,000 feet above and turned and that's the one I was initially tracking but he was in the sun when I saw the other two coming from a little farther over and different and the lead aircraft 
started firing at me very soon after I moved over to track them. But he shot briefly and they were closing rapidly. And so I fired a short burst and he turned and uh, I noticed his wingman now was kind of closing on me. The other, I didn't keep track of him, but, but the other guy came in and uh, he's dead ahead on with me. And we're coming like this and he's shooting. We're, at this time, he's in range when I switched to him. And uh, he's shooting and I'm shooting and he suddenly just quit. And he kept coming and coming and I kept firing. And he slipped right underneath me with no maneuver at all. And uh, in as much accounting for how many were lost, I have a feeling that he was dead. From then on, the other three are making an air attack because they are positioning while these others are now having to regain uh, a position on the altitude and uh, position. So from then on, it's one after time and I'm just flying along and we've got all these up here. And so I'm seeing this guy come at me and he gets in and I'm just turning as hard as I can into him to uh, mess up his aiming and so forth. And he's shooting and shooting and uh, most of them as a routine, regular good fighter pilot maneuver, pulled on up to where I'm unable to track or anything. And he's just going up for another shot and another guy's coming in. One of them made a mistake and uh, he, he came on in and he's shooting at me like this and he kind of ducked underneath me and he made a turn at my altitude and I was pretty close and I fired on him and uh, a lot of pieces started coming off the airplane and, and he was hit severely and I had to maneuver hard to avoid uh, hitting him. So at one point a, a guy goes in and he comes on by and I get a lucky shot on him from a good angle off and he starts slowing and I come on around and continue to fire and I run out of ammunition. But he's now smoking and just dropping out. And I look on around and here's another MiG and uh, he slipped on in while my attention's on this thing and I'm straightened out a little too long and I make a nice target for him and he hits me with quite a good angle off and put a 37 round right into this part and it went into the accessory section of the engine and really messed up my airplane and I had difficult with controls, uh, out of ammunition and he pulls in right behind me at an ideal probably um, 400 feet maybe and he's just shooting away and the only really operational, accurate, effective control I had was the elevator. Um, the cables to control the rudder were shot away and I could kick the pedals around but they were disconnected. And the uh, hydraulics for the uh, aileron control were shot and I had difficulty and it was out of, out of trim and I was having to use both hands on uh, the stick to maneuver. But he comes in and right behind, and luckily I'm aimed right at the task force, and we've got this big uh, snowstorm in between at 12,000 feet down. So I'm diving for that on the way to the task force, and he's just sitting there shooting, and I'm pulling back on the stick, and then just pulling and shoving it forward, and I'm going like this. And he keeps shooting over the top of me, underneath of me, and so forth. And we both ended up in the clouds. And he probably lost sight of me. And I, my attention is now to um, the condition of the airplane. Uh, should I eject? Uh, and, uh, no, uh, I wouldn't survive it. I'm too far from the task force for any rescue. And my time uh, of survivability and the conditions of the cold uh, water and so forth, I wouldn't have made it. So I said, best stick with it and uh, see how it comes out. I got so low under the clouds, I didn't have the, the capability for the systems at that time 
to eject safely. So I'm stuck in the airplane. I could, of course, crash land it in the water, which isn't 100% uh, survival, really, but uh, who knows. My problem is, how do I get this thing back on the aircraft carrier? One, two hands on the stick, and all this time I was at full throttle and probably using a lot of fuel, but I never checked on fuel. I just didn't have time to put my attention there. I put my landing gear down and my tail hook all by gravity because uh, I didn't have the hydraulics. And I'm testing to see at what point would I stall. And 170 knots was the point. Anything below there and I was losing control. I'm uh, back here and the ship is over there. So I'm flying, but I can't maneuver the airplane to come over and line up with the deck into the wind. But I could, I keep going at the air, at the ship. So I'm notifying the landing signal officer that I can't line up. He said, we'll cut you for an early wire. <laughs> and the ship's here in the wild, so like, I'd probably go like that and right over the side. I might have caught a wire and hang, but uh, not likely at 170 knots. So I was coming in hot, off center, looking bad, and the captain of the ship kicks it around and lines it up with me, and bingo, I land and catch number three wire, just like uh, it was meant to be. Fifty years plus had uh, transpired, and uh, the uh, story itself of the encounter was out there, but uh, the truth of the matter remained um, hidden until I was notified uh, that it was no longer classified, so I told my wife. <laughs> and she said, oh, Royce. <laughs> charmed life. Yeah. No denial. Why do you think you've lived such a charmed life? Well, if it gets down to that, I am religious and uh, Jesus Christ is my savior and I think he puts people on earth with a purpose and evidently I had one to serve and uh, I gave it my best. Uh, no, I, I always withhold it. I should do better, but uh, as good as I did, uh, I've gotten away with it. Wow. What do you think your purpose is? Wow. <laughs> to... Uh, be a disciple <laughs> and to, uh, I don't want to, I'm, I'm no example, but in the little part you play that people look up to older folks, sometimes if you're smart enough, even younger folks, but leaders, and sometimes in order to get their attention, I guess. Somebody has to do some unusual things, and maybe uh, maybe that's what I was supposed to do, but uh, I don't want to say like uh, David and the Goliath, but certainly David uh, had the strength of God behind him to handle that situation, and goodness sakes, uh, I was given an awfully good chance to die, and I just, did what I felt my purpose and training was for. And I think I was uh, probably God-driven and protected. And I'm certainly not that good. I haven't said that before, but that's it. I, I really feel blessed. Joe Foss, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor and someone who distinguished himself way beyond his World War II cockpit, had a saying regarding recognition. 
It ain't bragging if you done it. But just because you done it doesn't mean you go around bragging. Well, today, nearly 70 years later, Royce Williams is finally getting the recognition he deserves. Not just for the story of seven versus one, but for the reality that service and excellence are heroic in and of themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Royce Williams. Glad to have you here, Royce. Thank you. Royce, we're uh, getting questions from all over the place and they're being piped in here in, uh, into my earpiece. And here comes some of that awesome sound effect. <laughs> Aerospace. Aerospace, yes. Royce, the first question that I, I've got for you is, your story is getting a lot more interest today, 70 years later. And why do you think it's becoming so interesting for people? Well, for starters, it wasn't known for a lot of years. And then when I was first authorized to speak about it, and no one knew to even ask, so there wasn't a uh, audience. And first really became known in small Navy circles when I was asked to speak at a symposium in Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. And uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel retired, had quite a audience on email, and he wrote a very nice, uh, pretty accurate account of it, and uh, it spread it a little bit. But um, really, nothing until Admiral Shelton, of, who has become a friend of mine, took it on as a project, and it's come to fruition in almost eight years of diligence, for which uh, he has been noted and uh, given a, an honorary PhD. Right. And uh, through those efforts, um, and uh, trying to move a recommendation for a medal upgrade. Uh, the American Legion and others have widened the the audience, and uh, what you're doing probably will do it more so. When you brought up the question uh, about a medal upgrade, now for for your uh, for that November 18th uh, action, you were awarded the Silver Star. But when you're talking about a medal upgrade, it's for the Medal of Honor. That is the hope. The hope. Well, here's, here's a question from a, a listener that so many years ago, do you, do you ever think, boy, I wish I would have gotten the attention when I was 27? Does that ever cross your, cross your mind or are you happy with the way things turned out? Yeah, I live with what is, and uh, it became sort of a nothing, and more or less uh, made little difference in my life. Uh, certainly has changed somewhat now that uh, the word is out. We have a, another question that just came in. So we, when you're flying... How did you know that the pilots, that uh, the, the MiGs, when you saw the seven MiGs, how did you know that they were flown by Russians and not North Koreans or, in some cases, even Chinese? Well, I think I thought they were, and it was because that the MiG encounters effort, really, was pretty much limited to the western half of North Korea, and the planes flying out of more or less safe bases in China. And uh, it uh, really didn't have activity in our rather sphere um, of our fighting in North Korea. We, yeah, we were more interested in... Um, logistics and personnel and fire and close air support 
and uh, there wasn't any MIG activity. Rick, if you would call up graphic number 11, I, I think it would be, it'd be interesting for people to see mm-hmm. where this happened. And graphic number 11 shows a, a little uh, orange-yellow starburst where the, uh, where the uh, activity happened. And it's, um, it's actually just south of Russia. Yes. <clears throat> so I've got a question about that uh, from, from, uh, from somebody here from California. Were you aware of the geopolitical issues that would have happened, I mean, that were going to happen with, when you're engaging with Russians versus North Koreans? I mean, did that go through your mind that, oh, my gosh, I'm fighting the Russians? Not at the moment. I really didn't finish the answer to the first question in that uh, I had been on the first flight and it was just a few miles across the river was Russia, Soviet Union. And uh, I was aware that uh, it stirred up an awful lot of interest where they were launching aircraft and a lot of uh, radio chatter. Uh, So this response and the direction they came from in our political ge- uh, geographical position at that time uh, led me to believe they were likely Russian. Did you ever, uh, did you think about any of the implications of what would happen if this would turn into a news headline, you know, American pilot goes after Russian fighters? Yeah, uh, I, I was pretty well aware. I've always uh, been interested in geopolitics and uh, being on the carrier in the war condition and not having current um, media um, opportunities. Uh, we were fed very little about what reaction might be taking place, but in my mind, I could see that uh, we had been worried all along about complications. Certainly, the Chinese surprised us by coming in with hordes of enemy, and basically, the fight in North Korea was as much against China as it was North Korea. And, an awful lot of support came from other communist countries, and Russia was right next door. So it had to have been a matter of great concern all along. And at this time, uh, they were developing nuclear weapons. So as a State Department matter, it had to be darn serious. <laughs> Let's, uh, I've got a question about the MiG-15. Rick, if you can put up picture number six. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a picture of two MiG-15s flying. How um, how uh, how versed were you in understanding the performance of a MiG-15 versus the performance of your Panther? I had probably done as much looking into the matter as any other of the naval aviators there, and I had seen estimates, intelligence, and it was pretty accurate. Um, It showed it probably as versus the uh, F-86 from the Air Force that uh, in many areas they were co-equal and some the MiG bettered the 86 and likewise the 86 had a couple of features that were better so uh, but all of them were in a realm that uh, was significantly better than the airplane I was flying for air-to-air fighting. So the F-9F Panther, that was being used more for ground attack at the time? That was really the mission given to the Navy. And uh, we were, I think, rather good at it. Uh, (laughs) But that was really our, our main mission. And as far as our work up and practice uh, back in the States to be ready to fight, that's the type of training that we uh, concentrated on. 
Okay, I'd like to go back to your to your childhood. You know, I, I'm mm. a South Dakotan, you're a South Dakotan, and we tend to be pretty proud of being a South Dakotan. Yes. But, Rick, if you could put up graphic number two, that is uh, an Eagle, Eagle Scout uh, rank, correct? Oh, yeah, number two? Yeah. Yes. Did, uh, did Boy Scouts, do you believe Boy Scouts uh, played a part of... Um, your character building, what role did it play? I mean, you achieved Eagle Scout, and then you went on to, to start four troops. I, I, I would have to think that that helped make you part of who you were at the time of this moment. Oh, certainly. Um, I did a lot of work on farms uh, during the summer when school was out, and even sometimes if they had a need because of weather delays or rain or something, they uh, asked me to take uh, some time out from school and uh, help on on farm matters. Uh, but uh, with the athletics and uh, the camping and everything that I love to do, a lot of work. Uh, on on the water and swimming and it was the uh, uh, junior Red Cross uh, life-saving trained and it, it just fit right in with scouting yeah. which was of high interest and uh, I started achieving and I think that encouraged more <laughs> uh, build on that and uh, took time off from other things to pretty much by myself go camping out in the middle of nowhere and start w working on merit badges and uh, I liked it. Uh, there are today a lot of expanded uh, merit badges but uh, w the ones at that time were pretty much just right for a kid from South Dakota, with the loving the outdoors. Sure. And it taught you a, a sense of independence. Definitely, yeah. yes. Yes, I, a, a lot of time would just hike on out to uh, kind of forested areas and uh, by myself uh, spend a week or two. Kids don't yeah. do that today. No, I don't think so. Okay, we're getting a number of questions that are, are that play into what you were just describing. And the questions are facing hostile environments. I mean, there I don't think you can put yourself in a more challenging position. You've got, you know, fast forward to 1952 and you're in your Panther and you have seven uh superior MiG-15s. That's definitely a hostile situation. Uh, looking back, uh, how do you think you you uh, you reacted? Why do you think you reacted so positively? And now that you've had time in life to think about what you did, what kind of advice would you give somebody else who is in a similar hostile reaction or uh, environment? Well. Uh, I had faced uh, challenges before, and I had training for um, this event. Very little, I'll have to say, because in peacetime, it used to be that uh, they didn't want to take additional risk. Sure. So there was very little, very real, realistic training. Uh, there was safety built into what we did. So the real life encounter is somewhat like what you practiced, uh, but I had very little air to air experience. I had thought about it even as when I was a cadet. But uh, training kicked in, and um, the matter at hand, and proceed. So, uh, 
thinking between an F9F and a MiG-15, what strength did that Panther have over the MiG? Well, we're talking about aerial engagement. The um, MiG-15 had a better power to weight ratio uh, swept wing modern airplane with a advanced engine uh, building on the, what uh, was a Rolls Royce initially. And uh, with that, uh, they could out accelerate, uh, definitely climb, go to greater altitudes, um, greater speed, straight and level. And probably turning might have been pretty much equal. The advantage I had was a uh, computing gun sight. Really? And uh, we used to practice with kind of who we called it the iron sight. It was just mounted, and you would do your mental calculations of how much lead to give an airplane that's turning. And with this, you would put a, uh, a, a, a light a moving site to what we call the pipper, the aiming point, and just track the airplane, and then computers would calculate the amount of lead. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, a wonderful device. <laughs> That's a great, great time to put up the question uh, number, or put up the picture number seven. How close were you when you were... Uh, when you were engaged in, with these MIGs. And then the other question is, is how did we, how was it confirmed that you, you even had the victories? I mean, did somebody see them splash into the water? But mm -hmm. so answer the question, how close were you getting when you were shooting? And then uh, how did you have the victories confirmed? One event following the other and uh, each had its own dynamic and uh, by the time I opened fire, I was well within the range. I wasn't wasting ammunition. Uh, uh, and in one case, um, the 20 millimeters tore up the big airplane and pieces came off and uh, it was awfully close to hitting him. I had to make a urgent uh, maneuver to avoid collision. Sure. How uh, um, and how were the victories confirmed? Did some? Did, was there a boat in the water that saw the MIGs go in, or how? I mean, how did they, how did they know that you had actually shot them down? Well, my wingman at the uh, beginning of this fight, when four in uh, uh, and uh, a formation. We were all firing, and that started the event, and I uh, made a, a tight turn and ended up right behind their uh, last airplane within range and shot uh, a, a short burst of, of uh, bullets, and, uh, and he started, well, mainly he dropped out of formation. And the others pulled up into a, a, a real high climb, and I was following them. But my wingman followed the other guy that dropped out and uh, watched him go down. Mm -hmm. uh, another one uh, was smoking and intercepted but when I was out of ammunition and saying I could use some help sent him over, intercepted, fired at uh, extreme range and at 90 degree position with no chance of hitting, but as he was coming on the run to tail in behind him, the uh, pilot ejected. Sure. Uh, I, that's the only confirmation I know of what we knew. But of course the Russians knew, and in uh, the early 1990s as they broke up from the Union, the Soviet Union, uh, they made it uh, common knowledge in uh, putting it in their newspaper. Sure. With the names of four. 
there may have been others, but that I have one other name floating around, but it's uh, not confirmed like the others. So you know the names of the pilots that, uh, yes. and you know that they were lost. Yes. We're getting a question. Why didn't anybody else come to help you? I mean, you were up there all alone. What, do you ever wonder about that, or do you have an answer? Well, we had three carriers up there, and normally you would have one of them at the ready where they could launch. But uh, they probably weren't manned, and you've got to notify uh, the ready room where the pilots are, and maybe they aren't uh, dressed for it. Uh, because of the weather in wintertime, we were wearing a special immersion flight suit uh, to give you a little better chance of surviving in cold water. Mm -hmm. So it isn't likely that they were all set to go, and nobody ever expected that there would be such an encounter. So the time it takes and so forth, Actually, uh, the next ones in the air was my commanding officer with uh, four airplanes, and uh, he was airborne and below this 400-foot ceiling of in the snowstorm, and he spotted me coming back. So it, the, the fight was over and, as they were coming up to, rest, uh, to replace us. Uh, but he noticed that the uh, destroyers were shooting at me, so he got that stopped. And then he climbed through the clouds just in time to see in a distant two MiGs heading back to where they came from, Vladivostok. It's possible you may have, uh, may have uh, gotten a fifth victory, making you an ace in a day. Is that true? Um, it's possible. Uh, people are kicking that around. As a matter of fact, some would say even six because uh, the Russian historian has written a book about it and there were two returning to base and one of them uh, had some damage to it and was losing fuel and it uh, went in and the pilot was killed. So only one airplane that we know about Amazing. Uh, returned. We have a question from a nine-year-old boy. Who's, who's listening. Good. And I think it's a pretty cool question. He wants to know how much fuel was in your Panther when you came back. Because if you're up there and you're in a dogfight for 35, 38 minutes, and you, I, you told me off camera mm. that you had had that throttle 100% the whole time, how much fuel did you have in the carrier? Well, that's a good question, but um, the thought never entertained me. I had to handle the problem at the time, and I never looked at the fuel gauge. Wow. I'm sure it was just about out because our normal flight was an hour and a half, and this was a, an hour and 25 minutes or something like that. And normally, uh, you don't fly the whole flight at uh, 100%. Sure. So I'm, I'm guessing it was very low on fuel. Well, Let's go back to the moment where a MiG finally gets a shot on you and you take a, a hit from probably one of their 37 millimeter cannon. Uh, what did that feel like and then what did it do to the airplane? Well, they were, they were, there were a lot of shots at me way before this, but this was significant to hit me in the vital area right at the wing root and went into the accessory section of the engine before it really exploded and it uh, disabled the rudder by cutting the cable and it uh, ruined the entire hydraulic system which uh, you're depending on for some aileron control. Uh, so my uh, control of the airplane, besides it now being out of trim to where it took unusual force on the stick that I climbed to um, overcome the condition. Uh, I, so it was, uh, I, I, had, I had the elevator, the uh, part of the tail that makes you go up and down with the, the nose. 
And uh, this guy that hit me then, uh, with the excess speed and so forth, just came right on around and sat at a perfect range behind me, probably three, 400 feet, and just shot uh, full time. And I was just uh, dodging, going up and going down, as drastic as I could do it. And it worked. <laughs> and I could see the bullets uh, go under me and over me. And, but um, I got into the clouds. This uh, fight took place where the frontal system had moved on and it was clear air. But the carriers were still under this uh, storm system. And uh, when I got into that, uh, that probably saved my life. Uh, although the guy had done a lot of shooting from right on my tail before we got there. We started at 26,000 feet and the tops of the clouds were at 12,000. Wow. And you came back on the carrier and you landed at 170 knots, which is way over over typical landing speed. Yes. Yeah. And we're getting questions about the gun camera film. You're landed. I'm assuming that the gun camera footage is taken from the plane almost really quickly. Absolutely. And what happened to the gun camera footage? Well, I don't know a lot, a lot about it. It disappeared, and as I learned later and kept my mouth shut about it, that the NSA, which is now common knowledge, was on its first operational mission and concerning the whole operation, it was highly classified. So I think the film is in their hands, their depository someplace. Uh, I never saw it. I was given a little snippet of it, which uh, I use in uh, some of the training that uh, I did later on. But it didn't really show much of anything, and I don't know where that is. But uh, the basic coverage um, disappeared. And besides that, a little bit of handiwork on the sailor that developed it, thought he was Cecil D. DeMille or something, he did a little uh, editing uh, and scraps on the floor. So, it is where it is, and nobody that I know knows where that is. That's an amazing, amazing story, but it's not just the only part of your life. You uh, stayed in the Navy, and you made a career out of being a naval aviator, and you ended up uh, also serving in Vietnam. I, I'm curious, uh, how, many, how many combat sorties did you fly in, in Vietnam? Oh, I think uh, 130 or something like that. Yeah. One of the interesting aspects that I've found about learning about your service is that you were involved with the, uh, your Vietnam War service, that you were involved with, um, with uh, uh, meeting the families of, of uh, POWs. Yes. Describe how you interacted with the families. What was your role in, in reaching them? Mrs. Sybil Stockdale was the wife of the senior prisoner of war. James Stockdale. Yes, Stockdale. And uh, <clears throat> she became a source for intelligence and uh, uh, certainly with Navy intelligence, as was I, uh, as the director of Prison War Matters. And uh, I had pretty much full authority to do whatever I thought uh, would be helpful. And I was a member of all of the existing committees with the uh, joint uh, under uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense. Uh, I worked with the State Department and uh, personally met with uh, Averill Harriman in his home. Uh, but I felt if there's anybody that needs 
whatever we can provide in the way of information and comfort or help would be the people directly affected of family. Uh, some parents, but I mainly worked with wives. Uh, and I would uh, travel to centers uh, and letting them know in advance so they could invite uh, those in the reasonable area. And on, on one of those, I had an assistant of uh, Ambassador Herman, uh, who traveled with me from the State Department, and he became a very important figure later on. I can't think of his name right now from Maine, but uh, I think he was ended up as Secretary of uh, State at one time. We're, uh, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. We have a running out of time, but we're getting numbers of people who want to express their gratitude for your service, for your example. One of them is an Eagle Scout who thanks you for representing so well. But if you were to impart some life wisdom on the audience and recognize that your story here is going worldwide, uh, to people of all ages, what would you say to inspire uh, the next generation of people, of Americans? Well, of course, um, scouting isn't the only avenue that was very significant for me. I'm kind of a joiner. I was with the 4-H club and the Future Farmers of America. And part of it, I suppose, is um, society. You're not there by yourself. You're interacting, uh, uh, trying to achieve something. You've got purpose. And it's not, what do we call it, not a gang. If uh, that was the closest to a gang at that time, it was probably the Boy Scouts, and it was well purposed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and people who participated, I'm sure, even to lesser degrees, look back on that as an experience, and uh, with the experience you learn. And you know. so, for today, I can't put myself in their shoes. Uh, it's so different. But uh, everybody um, has a mind, and. Uh, some of it's controlled by others, but control what you can, enjoy, have some purpose in life. Uh, what do you want to do? And you probably list some things. Fly jets. And you might think they're beyond achieving, but uh, maybe you can find something to do that would help you decide. Um, you have you have to have purpose, and uh, not willy nilly and a leaf in the wind and do whatever somebody thinks is necessarily right for you. But wandering, if you are attentive and purposely doing something, you find the, the lead you need. And then, of course, the other is opportunity, a uh, big part of it. And don't be afraid uh, to get started someplace. Everybody has to at some point, and, and, and if you have somebody that can counsel you, uh, work with them so you grow up. Sir, this has been uh, just a, a great honor it's a privilege and uh we've been getting to know each other over the past couple months you know with putting together the film and uh, i just want to give you a personal statement of gratitude from everybody in south dakota we love your story we're hearing about it but i think you're also a national hero and a national treasure thank you for taking time to be here well it's my pleasure and uh, i uh, i think you've done something for me no. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have a 
We have a saying at old guys in their airplanes. When an old man dies or an old woman dies, a library burns. These debriefs brought together by the Distinguished Flying Cross Society uh, are uh, a way for us to uh, remember that there are libraries all around us in our families and the communities. That was really cool. Thank you. In the families and the, uh, the communities we reside. So though when, uh, when an old man or an old woman uh, dies, a library burns, if we get to know it, if we check out the volumes in their minds, we can pay it forward to generations to come. Thank you for, for joining. And uh, I just want to let you know that we have another old, old Guys in Their Airplanes debrief coming up, and we'll be making that announcement after Christmas. Thank you, and have a great day.